This one was a fun interview. This is my interview with drummer Steve Jordan. Now, he's also a producer, a composer. He was in the Saturday Night Live band. He was in the World's Most Dangerous band, the David Letterman band with uh, Paul Schaefer. Uh, he's been around, but you know, I know him from his work with uh, Keith Richards and Keith Richards' four solo records. They're great records. I think they stand next to the Rolling Stones records. Really, they hold up in, in comparison to the Stones records. Um, so, but Keith and, and Steve worked hand in hand on those records. A very strong collaborative team. He's also worked, Steve's also worked with Bob Dylan. That's a great story. And just his take on rock drumming. So that's, that's the real focus of this interview is where did rock drumming come from? Now, I understand when people say it comes from blues, it comes from, from jazz and R&B and so, yeah, but I don't, I don't get it. So I had Steve basically walk me through what rock drumming is and where did it come from? That was my big focus for this interview. Uh, we also talked about mastering and how important that is and just engineering in general and getting the sound of drums right. It's a, like I said, it was a really fun interview. And I also want to thank my friend Ken Michaela for setting up this interview with Steve and also recording the Zoom call. Thanks, Ken. But right now, this is me talking with Steve Jordan. I'm kind of confused. I'm not a musician. I'm, I wish. I wish I was a musician, but clearly I'm not. So I'm approaching this from a non-musician's perspective, but I don't really understand where rock drumming comes from. It doesn't seem like blues or jazz. I, I know that people say that it comes from that, but I don't. Well, hear it does. It that it's very way. simple. Okay, great. It comes from blues and jazz. Oh, okay. See, and gospel. What an idiot I am. <laughs> yeah, and gospel. But I, but I don't. Why is it that I can't hear it, other than me just being too? I, I'm not really sure, Steve. Like I don't know. But I mean, when I was hear. into Ringo, or I know Charlie Watts is a jazz, you know, but Keith well, Moon, Ringo's a per perfect DJ example. Wilson. Well, first of all, that's uh, okay. So let's differentiate what we're talking about here: rock okay. and roll drumming and rock drumming. Two okay. different things. Two different things. Okay. Rock and roll drumming is uh, where you have an element of swing to your playing. Rock drumming is where you just don't understand swing and you just play everything very blocky. <laughs> but great. That's a great So Ringo but, but is a rock and swing. roll drummer. Swing is, well, technically it's a dotted eighth feel within... Uh, a four four uh time signature that da 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 which is jazz ding ding da ding da ding da da ding but you you know so like it's almost like a little shuffle a kind of swing you know like you know like this you're swinging you know what i mean you're not you know like a, doing a you know <laughs> but, a but can a drum machine swing can a yes, you can. A absolutely you can? yeah mm -hmm. okay all, all right. right so it doesn't have to be human in its feel. Well, it's best when it's human, but you, but you know, we've come a long way. We've sent a vehicle to Mars and we've sent men to the moon and we've been able to program a dotted eighth and a drum machine. <laughs> okay. you know? Yeah. So at any rate, so certain people understand swing in their music. So like Ringo is a perfect example. He understands swing. He played in a skiffle, skiffle group, which skiffle, is based on a shuffle kind of a feel. And uh, so he understands that same with Charlie Watts. John Bottom understood swing. He loved listening to Al Jackson, the great Al Jackson. He loved listening to all James Brown records. So he listened to Clyde Stubblefield and Jabbo Starks and, and uh, Nate Jones and like that. But then there's certain drummers, if you listen, uh to uh i will you know obviously i'm not going to name any names but there's some people that just don't have any swing into their thing and that's why the bands are stiff um you know and there's certain drummers that replaced other drummers like okay you say like when uh like say for instance here again i'm not going to name any names you can do the research yourself but think of bands that had 
uh, original bands that were great and they had this special feel that was this chemistry and uh, and then they and then either the drummer died or they switched drummers or whatever and it never felt the same hmm. and there's a long list of those and i can tell you the reason why is because the replacement did not understand the swing element that the original drummer hmm. was aware of and brought to the music I hear you. Yeah. So that's why you have a lot of bad, what I say, barroom blues, where, you know, like you see these blues bands and bars and they're playing the song and it sounds like they should, you know, they have the right chords and the sound isn't that bad, but they're just no, the feel is wrong. There's because then that there's no element of swing in the feel of the music because hmm. everything is straight eight. Rock and roll is straight eighth against dotted eighths. So there's a push and pull, mm -hmm. you see? And that's what makes rock and roll. That is the roll against the rock. Where rock is just everybody's playing straight eighths, like they're, you know, like, you know, some kind of marching army kind of thing <laughs> or something, you know, like high-stepping kind of, yeah. German music. Okay, so, well, let me put it to you this way. So when I would listen to um, Keith Moon or B.J. Wilson, mm -hmm. who, from Colham, that to me, they're, they're not, to my head, to, they're not timekeepers. They're more like doing percussion fills and stuff. It's, they're just doing action. Well, yeah, well, Keith there? Moon, for instance, Keith Moon was a counterpuncher to Pete Townsend. Okay. So that's how I hear the who. Okay. There's a, there's a, a call and response oh, okay. between Keith and Pete. Right. And John is just kind of the thread that kind of holds it together. Okay. John is more the timekeeper in that group. Interesting. Okay. Right? And... They're like a big science experiment. You know, they're, they're, they're like a chemistry class. Let's uh -huh. drive, okay, you know, so Pete is this ingredient and and Keith is this ingredient and you put them together and they explode, you know, and then you have all these reactions. So everything, everything is like a reaction. Uh -huh. And that's what you hear. It's like explosive. And that's why they exploded on the scene and it, from musically to literally exploding on the stage. Right. Um, and that's, so that's basically it. So that's how they played together. And that's how I, I see them now. Then they had a few drummers uh, in between before they got Zach. Mm -hmm. And then Zach brought a swing element to the who uh -huh. because he understands swing. He understands the groove. So now all of a sudden you have the who with a groove. So like when Pino Palladino and Zach Starkey played with the who, they had a rebirth. So like when they played at Madison Square Garden for the concert for Heroes, that was a revelation. That's right before John died. Um, that, I think that was the last gig that John did with them, if I'm not mistaken. And that was an incredible, I was there. That was an incredible performance. Incredible. And now, so you had Zach who understood, you know, his godfather's uh, take on things. Plus he had his father's swing and his, uh, and his own personality. And he brought that to the who. And so that was all of a sudden they had a rebirth. Hmm. And, and and Pino didn't try to play like John Entwistle. He played like Pino Palladino, who's a groove merchant, but also a harmonic genius. And you put that together, and he had a completely different sound. The key was he wasn't trying to play like John because it wouldn't have been right for that. But he and Zach had a thing together as a rhythm section. And as the first time, there was a real rhythm section with the who. Hmm. 
Wow. I haven't, I haven't been paying attention to the later who, so I missed that, but I'll check it out. Well, you should Google that performance. Uh -huh. So you play bass, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you play bass based on some of the expensive wine art records. That's yes. how I know that. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so when, you're, when you sit down in the chair to play with a band with unfamiliar musicians, how do you communicate with the bass player or is it nonverbal? You just start, you listen to what they're doing and fit in? Well, I listen to the song first. It's always the song is your beacon. You know, you're trying mm -hmm. to satisfy the song, let the song play itself. Uh, and then if you're trying to, then once you understand the song or whatever, and you, and you let this song dictate what it deserves and what it needs and what it wants, mm -hmm. then you get into what everybody else is playing. Now, two different roles. Like if I'm producing, then I can be more verbal about what I think the song is asking for and what we need to do to serve the song. If I'm just a side person, then I defer to the producer. I don't try to usurp the producer's role in, in, in suggesting certain things or whatever. I let the producer make the choices. Now, of course, uh, I am not going to do something. I'm not going to play something that is um, contrary to my musical uh, thought process, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not saying that I'm going to undermine anybody, but I'm not going to do something that's absolutely ridiculous <laughs> for the song or something. Then I'll have to speak up and say, I don't think that's what we need to be uh -huh. doing. But, you know, but that, like I said, that's, you know, so there's, that's when dialogue comes in. And it's usually with the producer before you even start having discussions with the band. And it depends on what kind of producer you're working with. There's certain producers that just stand around and just facilitate the session, make sure things run smoothly. There's some producers who just make coffee for the band. There are certain producers who write out every note. Uh, they're like producer arranger people. There's certain people who, who, uh, are very extremely hands-on about everything that's done. I'm kind of in between, um, but I'm for, I'm definitely res I feel responsible for everything that goes on. So when I produce, I know who I'm hiring, so I know what to expect and what I uh, what I expect from them and what and what kind of exciting things that I know I'm going to get from them. That's why I'm hiring them. Right. So I encourage them. I encourage their creativity. And I'm hiring them because I know what they're capable of and, 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 and I'm excited about being excited about what they will do. Right. So it's a real joy to put, you know, part of the process for me as a producer is, to put combinations together that I know will come up with this glorious sound, make this glorious noise. Mm. And, um, and that's really exciting. I bet. Yeah. So like working with Keith, um, was that going to be obvious that you were going to be a co-producer with him on all his records or it's just, you were just going to be the drummer and he was going to produce? No, when I, when we started working together, um, um, it started uh, during the Dirty Work uh, record, uh -huh. and uh, that's the first time I worked with the Stones in the studio and got to see how they work and their the method to their madness, and that's when Keith and I became friends. I also became friends with. Uh, Woody during that time as well. And uh, I mean, I got to know all of them. I really got to know Ian Stewart, actually. Ian Stewart was the one who really <clears throat> would call me up and say, you know, I think the boys need you tonight. Come by the studio. And I ended up going to the, you know, I told Charlie, who I had met back uh, in 1979 when uh, 
I was the drummer for the Saturday Night Live band. And the Stones had played the first episode of Saturday Night Live in the fourth season. And uh, I got to know Charlie then. And uh, so when I was in Paris and, and I told Charlie I was in town, he invited me over to the studio. It's actually a little, you know, it's kind of, it was, the story is more involved, but I'm not going to get into it now. But it was a wild set of circumstances that led me to, to, to end up at EMI Pathé Marconi one night. And, um, and Charlie invited me to play. And what I did was, I didn't want to play. I, you know, being a Rolling Stones fan, my view was, well, if I, if I played drums with the Stones while Charlie Watts is alive, I should be shot. <laughs> so I'm not going to play Charlie, I told him. But what I would do is I'd play along with him. So he would play, and then maybe I'd play a hi-hat along with him or some percussion. Maybe in one song I played bass drum along, you know, I did, I would, you know, augment what he was doing. And we had a lot of fun. And that's when I saw Keith work, you know, because Mick didn't come to the studio every night. He came every other night. So on those off nights, we did a lot of experimenting. And I saw Keith do a lot of different things that I didn't actually know he did. I also got uh, found out actually how good a bass player Bill Wyman was, which I, he's very underrated, you know, like people don't think of bass players. They don't think of Bill Wyman, you know, that, you know, the whole, you know, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, the whole story about he got in the band cause he had an amp, you know what I mean? You know, that, that kind of thing. But, <laughs> but in fact, he's a, he's a good bass player and he had a really good feel. So that was interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Coming out of those sessions, um, uh, that's where we had, done, right. we had done a couple of things. First, we did, um, I think we did Hail, Hell, Rock and Roll first. Right, the movie. Right. Yeah. And we started to trust one another. Like I got Joey Spompanato in the band and, you know, we're looking for a bass player. I said, look, you need to see NRBQ is the bass player in NRBQ is, will be the perfect bass player in this Chuck Berry group that we're trying to put together. And, uh, so we went to the bottom line one night in New York, which no longer exists. And, uh, he heard Joey Spompanato and the rest is history. Um, and then I think we did, I, I, I'm a little confused. I'm not sure if we did, um, jumping Jack flash with Aretha before then or after. Um, and, uh, but they were right next to each other. So we worked on two very important projects back to back. And I, and I just told Keith on that one, I said, just make sure Aretha plays piano on it and then we'll have a great track. Mm -hmm. uh, because to me, she's, you know, she and Ray Charles are my two favorite piano players. So, um, you know, he, he, uh, you know, he uh, agreed with that. And so when we did Aretha, she had not only, learned the song in four different keys. She came up with the introduction. She had everything. She was totally prepared when we came into the studio <clears throat> because the one thing that we didn't want, which I know Keith felt the same way was we couldn't start out the song the way the original started out, which is the guitar riff at the top, mm. you know, or else we'll just sound like a Stones cover band. So Aretha came up with this whole intro un unbeknownst to us. We, we had no idea that she was going to do this. So she was already on the arrangement route to the song. So she said, okay, I got an intro, blah, blah, blah. She just showed us what she was going to do. And it was mm -hmm. awesome, you know? And then we like, holy cow, and it was a real blessing. And then we went in and just did it. Um, it was great. And we, we cut it at United Sound in Detroit. So anyway, we had done these two projects together that were very, important for Keith uh, 
as a solo entity. They were, you know, they were not related to the stones. And, uh, you know, and in fact, to Keith, hear Keith tell it, um, apparently, according to Mr. Richards, <laughs> um, it, when it looked like the stones were going to take a hiatus, Charlie went to Keith and said, well, if you're going to do anything outside of the stones, the guy you have to call is Steve Jordan. Wow. Nice. So, you know, Keith gives the, the whole uh, Winos idea credit to, to Charlie <laughs> because, you know, it was Charlie that was instrumental in solidifying the deal of Keith and I working together in a new, a different group hmm. outside of the stones. And, uh, you know, so that's how it started. So we just started hanging out playing together we went into a room we started one the first time we went in the studio together just the two of us a place called studio 900 in manhattan we went in uh, and according to jane rose his manager we went into the room and we uh, we went in there we went in for like 12 hours and we only came out to take a leak or something and then went back in or something crazy like that and so we spent a a lot of time just playing guitar and drums together and coming up with a thing. And then all of a sudden we'd have bits of riffs and then, then stuff that then we developed into songs. And then we started arranging some things and it was very clear that we were coming up with a team between the two of us. So it, it was a very organic process. You know, and then I, we we hung out a lot together, and we would just get in a room, sit down with a couple of guitars or whatever, and you know, get in front of a television, write some lyrics. You know, it was just a very organic uh, development. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you how do you how how did you become a songwriting partner? And now I know <laughs> I'm not to ask you the question, David. Yeah. Thanks. And you've done all four of his records, the three yeah. studio ones and the live one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, That's in great. fact, I'm mixing a new uh, <clears throat> a record that will come out maybe in the fall, um, Expensive Winos Live in London from 92. Um, and uh, it's very exciting. Hmm. <clears throat> and also a remastering of the second studio record, Main Offender. Yeah. And what a with change a, from the first one. So with different. a bonus track uh, on it. Yeah, I like the redo of uh, Talk is Cheap. It came out, I guess, last year. Or year yeah. You know? That yeah. was fantastic. Uh, thank you. That sounds yeah. so different than the original. There's a lot more bottom end to it for one thing. Yes, yes. Well, I love the bass. I love the bottom. So, you know, when we made the original Talk is Cheap, you know, it's very funny. CD mastering was an aside. It wasn't still a thing. We were still mastering for vinyl. Huh. And so Greg Calby, who was uh, the mastering engineer, who was the best in the world, who I only work with Greg Calby. I've been working with Greg Calby from that record to this day. You know, this is, he's the guy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And um, and so we did things to try to get bottom in uh, on the vinyl, okay? Um, by cutting the lacquer at different speeds. You know, we did all kinds of stuff to try to get more bottom out of the original record, you know? And when we did the CD, I don't remember who who actually mastered the CD, but you know the vinyl mastering room was really big, and the CD room was this little tiny room, and this female engineer who I can't remember her name, I'm sure that um, it's probably in the credits, or if you did the research, you could probably find out who mastered the who mastered the, the original CD. 
But um, like I said, it was an aside. Can you imagine in 1988 that CDs were not still the main thing? We still had vinyl in the dialogue. Right. So um, it's wild to see how many mediums have come and gone in, in, in a lifetime. But uh, at any rate, so in mastering this CD and this uh, the stuff, I, you know, I paid attention to this. I didn't even attend the CD <clears throat> mastering. I just, uh, we just handed off the tape basically and said, okay, yeah, make a CD, you know, make some CDs. <laughs> You know, because when I'm mastering, I'm very attentive. I mean, I attend all mastering. See, mastering to me is the final step of mixing. Huh. And in fact, if you look at your old records and it said mixed by and then remixed by, the remix is actually the master. So huh. um, um, mastering is everything. I mean, if you listen to records prior to them being mastered, they can sound like two completely different recordings. You know? Yeah. And um, so mastering and to have a genius like Greg working with you in the mastering process, he can make a record and save a record, you know? And that's why it's he's getting more work now than ever before because the actual level of engineering and recording is actually uh going in the wrong direction you know <laughs> you know high fidelity is is almost a thing of the past so greg calby and, and other engineers like him are uh, mastering engineers are saving records at a uh back-breaking clip because you know there's some bad recordings uh being handed over to be put out um and so they do a lot of work saving saving records on a daily basis. Yeah, you, you know that Rudy Van Gelder from Blue Note, because there are a lot of Blue Notes, he did in the pre-CD age, and well, in the 50s and 60s, he would cut the record. I mean, he would be the recording engineer. And then after the band left, he would cut the lacquer himself. So he yeah. was the recording engineer, the mix engineer, and the, the, he did the mastering. So he knew yeah. exactly what was going on. Yeah, I worked with Rudy. Uh -huh. And uh, it was an incredible experience to oh, work really? in in Englewood where he was wearing his white gloves. Nobody could get next to the console. Yeah, he was secretive. Um, and uh, it was a laboratory. You're walking into a beautiful laboratory. And uh, he had developed the sound. By the time I worked with him, it was during the CTI era, uh -huh. the Creed Taylor uh, industry era. And Ru Rudy had developed a sound um, with compression. He was really, really pushing the compression uh, to make these kind of jazz, uh, jazz rock, jazz funk records more radio friendly. So when you heard them on WRVR and stuff, mm -hmm. they sounded like hit re records as mm -hmm. opposed to the way he used to work when he was doing Blue Note records and stuff for Verve where they there wasn't the amount of compression there was like a quarter of the amount of compression, if any, on those records. They were just extremely high fidelity, very clear, very clean, beautiful. But then you get to like, you know, at the height of the, you know, the CTI era when they were having actually hit records like Grover Washington Jr.'s Mr. Magic and Esther William, Esther Phillips, rather, uh, what a difference a day makes when they were playing on the radio. So he started to pump the compression to make them sound like AM radio hits. So they were very, and sometimes it was like too much. It was like a little bit too much, 
you were it was just like you know it sounded like a jazz version of Led Zeppelin you know it was like wow you know and I don't get me wrong I love compression don't get me wrong but some of it was like wow you know wow it's, it's a little overkill on this one on this you know because it would take some of the sensitivity out of the drumming right uh, there are a couple of records that that there was just a little bit too much compression on the drums for my taste, and it sounded a little bombastic. Um, so, but when you're when you're either uh, just a, se a session player, uh, not not the producer, do you get to talk to the engineer about not him. as the, the sound of your drums? No way, no way. No, no. well, it, it depends on your situation. Well, it depends set, on like in, in 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 if. If you if it and like for instance with Rudy Van Gelder, there's no discussion. Are you kidding? <laughs> what are you talking? Are you kidding me? No, <clears throat> you know, absolutely not. Well, you know? well, in other sessions, though, other other situations, have you? How, yeah, how like you it really the, well, you know, look when I when it, the very first time when I was a teenager. And I learned a lot about recording from a gentleman, the late, great Charlie Conrad, who had a great studio called the House of Music in West Orange, New Jersey. He taught me a lot about recording, how to get a drum sound. Um, he was like, look, if you don't want to, it's just like anything else. You can't complain about the sound or anything if you don't know how to do it yourself. There. It's like you can't complain about the government if you don't vote, right? So you learn what mic pre's work for this, what microphones will give you that, you know, and more important than in anything, and you can refer to the great Al Schmidt about this mic placement, which is something that engineers these days don't know anything about. Right. You know, you move a mic a quarter of an inch either direction and you can go completely different sound. You can make a completely different record. Um, so it's the mic, the mic pre's, the compression, the microphone, the mic placement, all of these things. That's why some of our favorite records, they're not 24 tracks or 48 tracks or 96 tracks or infinity tracks. They're like three tracks, four tracks eight tracks you know and of course 16 tracks you know but i mean you know but it's all about mic placement the usage of of yeah i mean think of all the great big band records or early rock and roll records that still sound better than most records today with minimal yeah, miking yeah. minimal miking and minimal tracking and most of the time live. 